Shazam! Daily Bats. I choose you. As a champion. Say my name so my powers will become yours. Shazam. Wait, for real? Say it's okay! Say my name. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it would be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at JeromeC1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four- or five-star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you can do so in one of two ways. First, send an email to superheropantheon at gmail. Com. Second, find us on Twitter at Hero Pantheon. My co host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. Brian, we are taking two weeks away from the MCU as we will be, of course, ending the month with a bang. But this time we are going to we're going to we're going to go Shazam on everybody. So, Brian, we're in the end game now, right? Well, apparently it's DC's end game because they really have no movies in the slate coming up other than Joker which apparently is not supposed to be part of the canon or whatever, but uh, we'll see what comes up for the DCU, because it seems like the last four or five months, they built up some really good street cred with the fans, and I don't know, we'll see what happens, because Superman cameo, spoiler alert people, and he was headless, so we have no idea what the future of some of these castings is going to you know, come for the DCU, but we do have Shazam in the fold, and we have the Shazam family in the fold, so I guess you can kind of build from there. But, um, yeah, it, they kind of expanded the universe, but kind of kept it within itself in this whole movie at the same time. It's kind of weird. All right, Brian. Well, this was absolutely a movie that delivered in every conceivable way as far as the entertainment value. I think that the story was not as good as it could have been. And one of the things that was incredibly obvious was this was meant to be a Christmas release, perhaps when Aquaman came out. But as it turned out, this was... Just a Christmas film with superheroes in it, kind of like Iron Man 3? I guess, but this time we had Santa Claus being a total bitch in this movie. Santa Claus definitely stole the show, and we'll get to that in just a second. So it is worth noting that Shazam is actually an acronym using the name of the gods that give him his powers. Solomon is wisdom, Hercules is strength, Atlas is stamina, Zeus is power, Achilles is courage, and Mercury is Speed. I think where we have to start with this movie is with the dual performances of Kazam slash Billy Batson as Asher Angel, which is a great name on its own. Some alliteration going on in his real name plays Billy Batson in 15. He gets a lot of the emotional parts of the movie, including multiple scenes with the family, uh, the very emotional scene with the mother, and I think in some ways he is carrying the, the darkness of this more than Zachary Levi and I really like the opening scene as he is, we think he's about to steal a car, but he only wants information on a Rachel Batson and also steals the cop's lunch. But I thought that that, that was a very gr- good introduction to who this person is, who Billy Batson is, because it's not that he's a bad kid. He's just mischievous. In abandoned, mom leaves him at a amusement park when he's three and then, I guess by by the cast, you weren't supposed to tell that she was a 17-year-old mom, but later on in the, re- the movie, they kind of revealed that she was a young mom, and then once that, you know, she saw that her kid was with the cops, and she realized, hey, you know what, social service can probably do a better job than I could, and that's kind of what the whole backstory of him, you know, being abandoned was, and you kind of get that reveal at the, towards the end of the movie, in the, you know, in that dark end of the second act, but, um, you know, you kind of see it coming, it kind of, you know, adds to the character development, right? kind of tie in the whole idea of finding your own family. So that kind of ties in with the third act. I like that idea. But um, just the beginning for me was just kind of weird because it was two flashbacks back to back. And 
I couldn't get a sense of the timeline until once we got to the current time. But as I, I thought two flashbacks going back to back was a little too off. I don't know if they could have done the the villain stuff later on in the movie. I don't know if it should have opened up with that. I thought the focus should have just opened up on Billy as a kid. But they kind of went all over the place in the beginning. But that's kind of where the weaknesses lie in this movie. It's kind of like the script structure. But the performances are very well done, so that kind of makes up for it. So, originally I was going to discuss this later, but since you brought up the the way that this move, movie opens, I will instead talk about Dr. Thaddeus uh, Sivana as we get his background. It starts with him as a young child, but he is not pure of heart, so he does not get to be Shazam. And I, I really like the nod in this movie as John Glover, who is known as Lex Luthor from Smallville and has had a number of other uh, television and movie roles. He plays the father, and uh, I, I just really appreciated that. The ages of these characters are not altogether clear, and I think that's something else that was a little bit awkward. And I'm not sure I totally buy that the kid who was uh, Dr. Thaddeus would eventually become Mark Strong. They try to give him some background and build sympathy, but Strong basically behaves very poorly, and there's a lot of generic bad guy dialogue to the point where they even mock this at a certain point because he is caught monologuing at the end of the film, and Savannah tries to drown Billy Batson, and I will point out, Brian, this is the second time that a drowning happens to a protagonist in a superhero movie that takes place in Philadelphia in 2019. And this one didn't have Samuel L. Jackson. I don't know what that tells you about DC. Maybe they need to hire Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> Perhaps they do. But I think that one of the things that is worth noting is the, the shaggy runtime. It's two hours and 12 minutes. And I think you could kind of feel, feel that. I think if you could cut out a good 20 to 30 minutes of this, possibly removing some things. I'm not sure what you would have removed, but I almost would have liked to have seen the mother scene either move to a sequel or something, because it feels like they're trying to do a lot, both with the family, because the family is not just a mother and father, it's not even just his brother, but there's three other family members that are prominently featured in this movie, and ultimately, you know, at the end of the movie, we get to see them together, but it's really hard to build up all of these family members, have Billy Batson interact with all of these characters. Then he becomes a whole nother person in Zachary Levi. And we'll talk about him in just a second. But this definitely feels like it is two hours and 12 minutes. Yeah, they try to put a lot into it, even though I really like the third act. Because I've kind of known about the whole family of Shazam's kind of thing, because they've showed those in the cartoons and whatnot. But I just didn't expect them to do it like right off the bat and introduce all these characters at the same time, and they kind of did that by the end. You kind of can tell, like, they were kind of building up to that because of the, the you know, the brothers and sisters and the foster home kind of thing. But by the end of it, I kind of enjoyed it because it reminded me of Power Rangers. It gave, it gave, like, a Power Rangers kind of vibe with the different color suits that they all got at the end and stuff like that. But it felt kind of rushed and kind of unexpected, and I kind of wish they saved that for a sequel later on, but... I guess they figured that they have to kind of put all their cards on the table right now because they don't even know if they're going to get a sequel, I bet. Because going into this, you don't even know if this was going to be a hit. Like a month ago, the buzz was not nearly as big, but I think those screenings a couple weeks ago before the movie came out kind of helped and got the buzz going. So I think now it's going to make that, that money that, you know, that DC is probably going to be used to with $300 million a movie kind of thing. So I think it's going to be fine. Right, this movie is slated to make $50 million, and I think that one of the issues with opening a movie like this in the month of April is that you were really dancing very close to the big Marvel movie this year. And that's really not something that they may have to worry about next year. So I almost wonder if they would have been better off. But clearly they, they had a very specific vision for this film. I agree with you that those screenings added a tremendous amount of positive buzz because even if the plot of this movie isn't great and even though it is very long in two hours and 12 minutes, I think this is probably one of the funniest and most engaging superhero movies that I've seen in a long time and that even includes a lot of the Marvel movies. I just think it's really hilarious. I think the montages and the videos that they're shooting, they work out really well. I love the direct reference to the movie Big when Dr. Savannah runs across the keyboard. There's some great jokes in the convenience store about the DC Universe, and really throughout the movie they make references to Superman and Batman. Uh, you mentioned Santa Claus at the beginning, that running gag with Santa Claus stealing the show. 
as he behaves the, the opposite of everyone. And even Sue uses some F words on the uh, television at the end. Uh, I really like the stuff with the bullies. That was also really funny. And the car being dropped from the sky. You could totally see it coming, but just the timing of that worked out so well. And I think you, you have to give Asher credit uh, for his part in the comedy, but of course you have to talk about Zachary Levi as Shazam. He's just really goofy and positive, great conti- great comedic timing, and I think he balances the action and the comedy very well, which is something that he is used to from his time on the Chuck TV series. And I, I just think that even though I don't think Billy Batson and Shazam are as well connected as they could have been, I think the individual performances are very, very strong. And it's great to see Zachary Levi just get to kind of do his thing in a superhero movie because he was in Thor 2, he was in Thor Ragnarok for about a minute, and you never got to see that. But in this movie, you got to see Zach, got to see Zachary Levi at his best, and it was great. I really, really loved how funny and engaging this movie was. And Zachary Levi and Jack Dylan Frazier as Freddie Freeman, they were a big reason for that. Yeah, I mean, you got to give credit to Big. Like, I was as soon as I saw the original trailers for this movie, I was like, oh, they're doing Big. That's smart. They're doing the right kind of dynamic. Because I always felt like Big, or any kind of like comedy where an adult turns into a kid or vice versa you're 13 going on 30s you're freaky fridays there's some kind of like magic in that where an audience can kind of like get drawn to it and i can't explain it it's a thing that audience audiences have been doing for like decades now so i think this formula works and you put it in the right kind of context with a superhero movie and they and they kind of delivered now i said the script does have its problems but at least the structure is built around the relationship between you know freddy and shazam right so that relationship is kind of the key, and that's what kind of the key in Big was. So obviously they did the reference to that. I kind of forget, but there's kind of sort of another kind of connection, I guess. Well, I mean, it's a Ron Howard connection, but isn't Freddie the nephew of Brian Grazer? I'm not sure on that. That is a very good question that I don't because have I the answer to. Because I remember he's from It, because he's from It, and I remember reading that he got the part because of the, the connection and that Brian Grazer saw him, and then he was like, you should be in a movie, kid. You know, you're my nephew, and whatever, whatever, but... Yeah, there's kind of a little that side Hollywood connection there, but um, but yeah, I mean, I love that that the script uh, idea that they came up with, but I think the performance is really delivered to the point where everyone kind of got into it, and that's what you wanted really wanted was because if that relationship doesn't work, the movie doesn't work between those two. So uh, props to them, and then Zachary Levi, it felt like he was even more of a kid than Asher <laughs> at times. It was so weird. Like I know they were the same person, but at times it just felt like. Him as Shazam was even more kid-like than the actual kid. But I also like the idea that they're doing YouTube videos. It's very a modern take on a superhero and what a superhero would be like in 2019 where if you if you just got powers and all of a sudden you wanted to be famous and stuff like that, you would just film yourself on YouTube. And that's exactly what they did. So I like that little touch too. I think the relationship is great. Jack, Jack Dylan Grazer is, is good as Freddie Freeman. He was really good in It as well. I like the fact that they de- they don't really reveal how he came to be disabled. That was not a, a crucial part of the plot, that he was just disabled and he is a part of this family and they love him and they accept him because I think that is something that we don't often get to see in storytelling even now is just seeing disabled people function normally. And he does get to live his dream by becoming Adam Brody. I, I, I guess I wonder if he was celebrating Chrismica. As long as there was no OC jokes. I'm, I'm just glad you got that reference because I was a little iffy about if you would get the Chris McCoy reference, but I very much appreciate that. I, I do think that the film cannot necessarily decide how much we're supposed to be on Freeman's side because there are times that he does behave like a dick. He, there are times that he be, does behave selfishly, and it's it's not really decided whether we're supposed to take his side or whether we're supposed to take Billy's side because... Billy also does behave very immaturely at times by running away and, of course, um, d- doing lots of shenanigans at Shazam as they go into places they should not necessarily be in. For Brian, uh, do you want to talk about those uh, those moments? I mean, yeah, he goes to a strip club. He's supposed to be an adult. He looks like an adult. He's actually 14 inside. So, yeah, this, that's definitely a fucking, you know, what a kid his age would probably do if he had those kind of powers and then it was funny like he i guess he has the power to teleport too which he kind of discovers at the end but he can only teleport to places that he can think of in his mind so the first thing he thinks of is the strip club and he takes his family to the strip club and he transports them out so that was 
a little dirty kind of a scene there, but uh, I picked up on it, and it was, I thought it was really funny. So props to that. I'm not necessarily sure if he could teleport, but I, I think he could teleport out of that specific space uh, to wherever he wants to go. So I think that's kind of what they were going for. Something else that I really appreciated about this movie is that this is one of the more positive portrayals of foster families that has ever been realized on screen, as all the kids are, are good people. Um, maybe a little precocious and mischievous at times, but the parents, uh, Mar- Marta and Cooper Andrews, they are played by Rosa Vasquez and Victor Vasquez, respectively. I think that they are just really sympathetic and loving, and I think that's that's something that we don't, again, often get to see in a lot of these movies, but the fact that the Foster family exists and that they are there to help Billy, I think, is is a positive. And I almost wish that more focus had been had been placed on that, and less on Billy's journey trying to find his mom. Because I kind of think that that would that it was a distraction in time and kind of muddled things. I was waiting for that moment where they were supposed to comfort him after he found out that his mom abandoned him, but we never really got that. So I thought that was kind of weird, and I thought that they would have had that more of a connection between the new foster parents and Billy. But they created more of the connection with the kids as opposed to the parents. So I don't know if that was like on purpose or there's some deleted scenes somewhere. But it did feel like the parents were shortchanged. I got that feeling as well. But maybe they're just going to build that up more in the second one if they thought that out. But um, it was kind of weird that they weren't there to comfort him saying that we'll accept you in open arms after your mom just rejected you. I also thought it was, uh, I don't know what your screening was like, Brian, but the moment when all the kids got into their Shazam costumes, it got very loud applause at my screening. And obviously being at the the preview screening meant I was with uh, some of the hardcore, so to speak. What was it like in your screening? Did they, uh, did they get a loud ovation? See, my screening was at 10.30 late night. It was full, but it wasn't a lot of smart marks, per se, because, like, there was, like, a lot of response to stuff. When that was revealed at, at the end, at the final battle, people were like, huh? Uh, less. It was more of, like, uh, what's going on kind of thing as opposed to, like, oh, my God, that's the Shazam family kind of thing. So it's definitely going to, you know, affect different audiences differently. But my audience was more casual, so it was hard to say. I wish I went to those screenings two weeks ago, but I – that day, I ended up seeing us instead. But yeah, I can only imagine the reaction that would have gotten. Because it, I mean, for something like that to be kind of hidden from everything in the advertising, I like that. You know, no one saw that coming. And they kept it very hidden in the advertising, so I like it when they hide stuff like that. Yes, I am really glad that they hid that also, and that's not something that they gave away, because it is one of the most important and unifying points of, of the whole movie. And I think whereas a lot of movies, especially Marvel movies, have trouble in the third act, I think it just, it really shot a lot of life into the third act, a third act that could have been very boring and very perfunctory if Shazam was going to do what he was going to do. But just having a lot of those character interactions, even the moment when Eugene does the shout-out to Street Fighter, I mean, you got a lot of those little moments involving the kids embracing their new powers, and I think the third act was just so much better because of that. And again, I'm not saying that the, the villain was great. I think Mark Strong did all he could with the role, but I was I was never really fully engaged with the plot of this movie, but I was definitely engaged in in the moments, and I think that's what this movie does so well, is it has a lot of great individual moments that kind of add up to make this movie much better than it probably would have been if the moments didn't work and if it wasn't as funny as it was. Yeah, like I said, that's all based on the establishing those relationships right from the start, because like if... If there's no basis for these relationships, we would not care as much, and then the, the movie would just kind of fall apart. So it would be like Green Lantern, basically. And again, another Mark Strong reference I know. I kind of made that on purpose. Obviously, Sinestro, hello. But um, yeah, luckily, this was a lot better, and I think Mark Strong did a lot better than he did a Sinestro, so that's good. And it looked like he was having more fun, and yeah. So I, I also shout out, I forgot the name of his dad in the movie. What's his name, the actor? John Glover. Yes, yes, from Gremlins 2, the, yeah, yeah, I love Gremlins 2, so that was my shout out, (laughs) he's in that, and he's the corporate guy, and he gets all crazy in that movie, so. Yes, John Glover is pretty great in a lot of these movies, and uh, I want to talk about the office scene, because there is a moment when Dr. Thaddeus goes into the office, and there are a number of executives sitting around, and Brian, because you and I have the exact same thinking on everything, there is a scene from another movie that this reminded you of idolaters all of you 
right? Yes. Yeah, so it was the dog the scene, and I I'm not the only one who thought that. I immediately went in my DM my friend. And I was like, "Yo, you just saw Shazam. Did you just not feel like you just watched that scene from Dogma?" And he's like, "Yeah, dude, I got the same feeling." So basically, the scene is he goes to his father's corporation, and you know he's possessed by the seven deadly sin demons or whatever. And he's going to kill, like, everyone on the board, including his father. And he just unleashes the demons and then becomes this giant massacre inside of a boardroom, right? And I was like, God, this is so familiar. And then I realized, oh, it's the scene from Dogma where Bartleby and Loki go ape shit and kill everyone in the movie's boardroom. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that was on purpose, but it definitely was the same vibe. And I, that's okay, because, like, not a lot of people reference that scene in, in movies anyway, or, like, at least you know, like, pay homage to it, so I was kind of like, whoa, okay, this is definitely a Kevin Smith kind of shout-out, in, in some kind of fashion, it, it's gotta be. And anyone who thinks Ben Affleck cannot act needs to go back and watch that scene, because it's probably one of the best directed, acted, and shot scenes that Kevin Smith has ever had in one of his movies, so I, I definitely agree with you that, that that was a great moment, and I think the scene was well executed, and the thing that I love so much about so the movie, again, even though I think there are some issues with the plot, I think the CGI looked really good. The demons looked much better than a lot of the Marvel creations. If you look at the demons in Shazam and even compare them to the the, the creatures in Avengers Infinity War, these demons look a lot better. Shazam suit, I know this is a big point with you always talking about the suit. It looks really good. It was very bright. Uh, the orange and the yellow look excellent, and even though this was filmed at Christmas time, which means there were going to be less colors because it's dreary outside, you still get a lot of contrasting colors, and uh, it's a great, great visual palette. Yeah, I mean, the red, the yellow, and then that bright yellow lightning bolt, the way that they lit up the lightning bolt in the middle, I thought at first that was a little too cheesy, but then the way it plays out in the movie, it really comes into effect into the plot because a lot of his energy and power comes from that. So that makes sense. And then when everyone else got their suits and they had the different color suits, I marked out because that's such a Power Rangers kind of thing that, you know, I think is kind of underrated when you have a team up movie and everyone has their own individual color set. I'm very much a fan of that. So like it really worked out at the end and everyone got their individual colors and then making good got the purple and then the other guy got the green. I thought the, they just did it really well, right? And in terms of the look, they got it really down, I think, if you compare the comics. I mean, even, the, like, the detail on the little hood, and they, he never really used the hood, but there's that white hood that he has attached to it. They had a lot of detail on that hood, too, because there was, a, like, a lot of inscriptions or scriptures on top of the hood. So they got a lot of the details right. And you mentioned with the CGI, I thought it was really well done as well. It kind of reminded me, I don't know, did it remind you of Ghostbusters? Like, the way that those things started coming alive and the eyes, I thought that was a really kind of, like, I don't know if it was a homage or whatever, but it definitely gave you those kind of Ghostbusters one type vibes. It gave me that. So I, I dug that a lot. And the idea that, you know, I like these uh, creature features where like stuff comes to life from like a statue and stuff like that. You know, so I'm kind of a fan of like creature features like that. So this kind of was up my alley at the same time. Definitely. I think that there was this there was a lot of 80s kind of vibes going on throughout this movie. The fact that it takes place at Christmas and there's a lot of connections to big I think you got all of that. And I kind of want to end by talking about the mom stuff again because I'm really not sure that it works. And what we've seen in a lot of recent superhero movies, both Captain Marvel and Shazam, is uh, kind of the idea that memories are not accurate. And when Billy Batson reflect on, reflects on being separated from his mom, he kind of sees it one way, his mom sees it another way. And... Well, I think the scene itself is is good. I think it's well acted. I don't think it really gets enough time to breathe because the way that the memory is shown, it, it creates a lot of confusion. And basically, Billy Batson goes right from talking and having this emotional conversation with his mom right away just going into the third act. And I really wish that we had more clarity. And I think that's part of why, even though this is two hours and 12 minutes, I think this, again, lends idea, lends to to the idea that this movie just had too much going on in it. My worry was that if they saved it for the next movie with this hype of who his mom was going to be or was he going to find his mom, that kind of thing, I think it would have been overhyped, kind of like the way people overhyped Force Awakens, like I totally did about Ray's mom. So I think maybe doing it this way kind of takes away that pressure 
of like, you know, is he going to get his mom back or is he going to have this big reuniting moment with his mom? The thing that we had in Ant-Man 2 with the Van Dynes. So I think maybe this was the better way to do it because if they're going to just disappoint us with a really disappointing mom and do the whole like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air thing, like, how come you don't want me, man? So that's the vibe I was getting. So yeah, I'm glad they did it this way because if they would have just left it open for the sequel, we would have just been wanting more out of it and being so disappointed by that disappointment that he was rejected all this time. Interesting. I I don't know. I think that once, hopefully a sequel will kind of alleviate some of my concerns, but ultimately I, I feel like DC is still headed in the right direction. Aquaman and Shazam are far from perfect, and I don't think they reach the heights of some of the Marvel movies, some of the very best Marvel movies, but what I appreciate is that we have two very different visions for what a superhero looks like. Marvel, I think, has got the formula down, and they're never going to deviate from it. I think Marvel is giving the directors more of an individual voice, and I like the fact that the visual palettes are so much more different, and that they're not focusing on creating a universe right now, that they are just focusing on these individual characters. And uh, I am sure that Batman and Superman will eventually come back, but the fact that Wonder Woman made the amount of money that it did, the fact that Aquaman is the second highest grossing Warner Brothers movie of all time, Exi- I mean, it's, it's out there. Shazam's going to do very well. I think the DC is is in a very good position. And you mentioned the Joker movie. That, that is a trailer that recently came out. I don't know if that movie's going to be good. I don't know if it's going to make $500 million. But that is a movie that people are going to be talking about when it comes out. See, I have my worries now because I'm kind of just... I don't know if this is breaking news, but there is an article that was re- released a couple days ago. And I forgot to send it to you last night because I was really tired. <laughs> But uh, Arthur Fleck, the Joker that we're going to see portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix, has filmed a cameo apparently for Birds of Prey. Well, that'll be that'll be something different. I, I just I don't know how that's going to work. I am very curious to see the Joker movie and Birds of Prey to see if they if they do in fact connect with one another. I mean, we'll just have to see because it's all it's all rumors and innuendo. I have no doubt that. It may be true, but let's let's see the execution before we make full judgment on it. That's all I'll say. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm really... I mean, I was up for this Joker movie up until I read that, and I was like, oh, no. They're trying to force it. Because if you look at that trailer, and I guess it's a little, like, side time for the tr- to talk about the trailer, um, you see Thomas Wayne, and it looks like this takes place in the 80s. And if you do the math, that would make... I don't know. If they're trying to connect this universe, which they shouldn't, and they're trying to force it, it's going to make the Joker like a 70-year-old dude Or by the time we get to Batman, or I don't know. It's just, it's kind of weird, and I'm hoping that they're going to do something way different and kind of shock us, because I would not be surprised if that's not actually the Joker. Like, it's going to be, like, that's Joaquin Phoenix's interpretation of it, what would be the Joker, and then you see Jared Leto come in and take over and become the Joker or something, because that would not surprise me. I do not want to see Jared Leto as the Joker again. Let that never ha- That That is just... Ugh, that sounds terrible, because everybody hated working with him. He was a nightmare. The performance was bad. The movie was bad. No, no Jared Leto ever again as the Joker. I don't even want to see him as Morbius. Please keep him away from any and all superhero franchises. I don't know, man. They they seem insistent about connecting everything, but if they're going to retcon a bunch of stuff, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be whack. Because I don't know. I'm already kind of... The fact that they said they're going to remake Suicide Squad... And I was just like, how are you going to remake something if it's in the same universe with the same people? So there, there's my you know, criticism of the current DCU. I don't know, but that's this rumor innuendo. But a lot of these rumors and innuendos turned out to be true in the last couple of years of what we heard about the shit going on behind the scenes with Justice League that what ended up what we got. So when there's smoke, there's fire to some of these things. So I'm just – let's see. Let's just hope they kind of separate everything out. But if they kind of shoehorn in this continuity stuff, I it's going to – be really confusing it's going to be very very confusing but look we've got a few months until joker and until then i think we've just got to show some patience here because i think that the dc has has earned a little bit of leeway now with these 
last three movies, and hopefully James Gunn has an idea for how to make the Suicide Squad fit in or not fit in or do whatever he's going to do because James Gunn is one of the most unique creators within the realm of superhero movies, as we know with Guardians of the Galaxy. So I, I have some confidence that he is going to be able to make this work. How it's going to factor in, we don't know. At some point, Brian, you and I are going to have a, a good conversation about Zack Snyder and the way that he basically ruined this entire thing and screwed up the idea of a DCU because I'm convinced that Zack Snyder is as as much to blame for this for this debacle as anyone because I think it's years later and I think a lot of the effects of his kind of vision have have infested a lot of these a lot of these DCU movies and that that effect is lessening the farther we get away but even the fact that the Aquaman there was no chemistry between the two leads and Wonder Woman had tons of slow motion I think you're still seeing that the Zack Snyder effect is still in effect in some of these DCU movies yeah let's get away from that and I guess the word retcon is going to be a common thing in the next year or two so let's see how they rework the timeline all right, let's get to the burning questions before we get out of here. This was supposed to be a Christmas release, right? Yes. I don't know if they just switched out because you were right. Like This seemed like the perfect Christmas movie, but it was almost like they switched the release dates. But then again, I guess Aquaman was always supposed to be a December release, so I don't know what they were thinking. But whatever. I mean, it's not, it's not a Shane Black movie, that's for sure, because Shane Black loves to make Christmas movies, but it was definitely supposed to be a Christmas movie. For sure. Question number two, does this mean... The rest of the family can have Shazam powers in future sequels. This is something that I'm kind of surprised we there, there was not more clarity. It felt like anyone who touches the staff can get the powers right at this point. So I'm not sure if those powers are exclusive to the kids. And then if you do the math, there's another extra chair. Did you notice that? Yes, I did. So there's another one out there, probably a bad guy to get the powers or something, but... I don't know. I didn't like that they didn't really explain that because I just felt like he could have just had any six people off the street or five people off the street touch the staff and help him out and get powers. Absolutely. All right. This is the most important question because Henry Cavill was not Superman. It was just his his suit is all we saw. But here's the big question. How did Shazam meet Superman? I thought about this. Now, if I was Shazam and I just got these powers and I'm a 14-year-old kid and – I'm a big fan of Superman. I would probably go and fly to Metropolis and wait until he just showed up in the air and just, you know, started a conversation with him. Because at this point, everyone kind of knows who Shazam is within the city of Philadelphia. Therefore, you know, one city knows, another city is going to know. It's going to kind of spread around, like, you know, the way the Batman urban legend kind of spreads around in the DCU. So I'm sure he just went to Metropolis, said hi, and they started up a conversation and became best friends. All right. Is Digimon Hansu the man to build the bridge between the DC and the Marvel universes? Because he was in both Captain Marvel and Kazam and Guardians of the Galaxy. But of course, Captain Marvel and Kazam have some very shared history. So this is all very confusing. Quick recap. Originally it was owned by, I think, DC, the, the Captain Marvel name or something. And then one sued the other. I don't know the exact details off the top of my head. So we ended up where Captain Marvel just got, the name got dropped. And they just threw the name Shazam at him because this was recent as 2011, I think, that they were still suing each other over the name. So now we got a month apart, Captain Marvel and Shazam, who was original Captain Marvel. And, you know, uh, with uh, Demon Hansu in both movies, it's just so weird. And I was thinking, like, this guy is playing with both um, DC and Marvel and he's just getting, been, he's just getting paid and he's having fun out there, and he's one of the few that can actually play in both worlds because there's no way a top-tier name can do that. So good for him to play both sides, kind of like WCW and WWF back in the day in the 90s. That is a very good, succinct explanation. I, I don't think I could have done that because it's just it's too chaotic. All right, Brian, is this the best superhero movie to take place in Philadelphia this year? Yes, because it's, it's this or... Uh, Unbreakable 2, uh, or Glass, or whatever, but, uh, yeah, I mean, what other movies are going to take place in Philly this year? I don't know. I mean, we might get a shot of Philly in Endgame, but, uh, yeah, this is so weird that both movies <laughs> took place in Philly, and both movies had um, a cop drowning a person in the puddle, so there you go. Pretty crazy to think about. Yes, I definitely think this is better than Glass in a lot of ways. I think it was more entertaining. 
But there is something about glass that has definitely stuck with me over these last couple months. And again, not saying it's good, but that is a movie that I think we're going to be having a lot of conversations about in the years to come, about whether it was good or not, why it was good, why it was bad. So I, I think we're, we, need, we need to revisit Glass at some point and in a couple of years and have another conversation about it because there, there's a lot to that movie. And I still find it satisfying despite the kind of uh, so-so ending, but I found it satisfying. It is, uh, it is definitely a mess. Speaking of major disasters and big messes, Brian, next week another superhero movie is coming to theaters, and it is Hellboy... Brian, the advertising for this movie has been dreadful. I have no idea what to expect. My expectations are extremely low. What I'm expecting is that, well, what I'm reading is that it's very gory, so I'm hoping that, well, at least we'll get this, like, old-school, like, R-rated gore kind of fest thing that, you know, like, horror movies are known for. So maybe that's what they're kind of going for, like a horror gore fest, but that's okay. It's I don't know what kind of audience is going to reach because it's definitely not reaching the same audience that the original Hellboy did because this is an R-rated movie uh, and they're just going for a different kind of style and audience and I don't know if the Netflix Stranger Thing audience is going to like come you know clamoring clamoring David Harbor I don't know what's going to happen but David Harbor is not the kind of star that is for needed for this movie it's great that he got the role but I don't know if he's like the right guy to like fill the name of the top bill kind of thing you know what I mean so I don't know. I uh, I really like David Harbour on Stranger Things. I think he's been a tremendous character actor. But Ron Perlman was so good as Hellboy. For all of the flaws of the first two, Ron Perlman had this role nailed. And honestly, it just comes off like David Harbour is doing an impression of Ron Perlman. And it's not going to be as good. There, and the other thing is that Hellboy has so much makeup and it's really hard to have a good performance, as we know from some of these superhero movies and the issues with that. But I just do not have a lot of confidence that it's going to be good. But hopefully it is. Hopefully we can come on here and we can talk about how great Hellboy was and how April is one of the best best months for superhero movies ever. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. But we will discuss Hellboy next week. And then in two weeks, of course, is the big one. I've already got my tickets, Brian. Have you, have you gotten yours? Yeah, and I actually got the day cleared, I think, because I actually had to I put a time-off request even though it's a new job, but technically because I work at nights, I had to technically ask for the day off. But uh, yeah, 10.30, 3D, IMAX, I'm there. And if I've got the energy for it, I might actually watch it back-to-back again at like at a fucking 2 a.m. showing because I'm nuts. But if I'm surrounded by a bunch of like hardcore fans, it'll be worth it and it'll give me the energy to stay put. Because I, I mean, after that first showing, I know immediately I'm going to have to watch it again and again and again and I might just do back to back on the same night. So I am going to see it on a Thursday night in regular, and then I'm going on Friday morning at 11 a.m. to an IMAX screening. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And all I can say is thank you, AMC list. And we are probably going to record a podcast literally on April the 26th. That is that is my hope and desire, so that we can get that podcast knocked out and posted before the weekend. That'll probably happen with my new schedule. All right. So for Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening. Next week, Hellboy. No ticket.